And uh, what better way to welcome Leonard in than with Rabbi's ways of warming us with his wisdom and humor. Um, and so I just want to um, thank Rabbi for his uh, continuing generosity um, to share his gifts with us. And um, I'll turn it over to him. Please help yourselves to snacks. Get up as you need to. There's coffee over here. Um, and just again, thank you so much for being here. Rabbi. Chris, it's coming. Uh, good evening. Uh, it is uh, I who need to uh, thank uh, the amazing staff here uh, at uh, Countryside for uh, welcoming me and uh, for providing me uh, with a room and shelves uh, for my books. And uh, I think we need to build a few more shelves because there's not enough room, but uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, so, we have uh, so we have three sessions, uh, and I called uh, those presentations a taste of Judaism, just a taste, uh, which hopefully uh, can help uh, all of us. And I see uh, many of you who attended the uh, uh, Monday morning classes to figure out what else would you like me to teach. Uh, I'm open for any kind of suggestions. Uh, just give me, uh, you know, uh, time to prepare some of the stuff. Uh, just because I'm Jewish and uh, I'm a rabbi doesn't mean that I know anything. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so just a little bit of uh, conversation today. I need some help to distribute uh, some of the material around. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I want to make sure that um, you will see, uh, I know that uh, maybe it, it's causing some consternation, uh, the budget uh, on, on paper. Uh, it's like an inside joke. Uh, but there is no way, no way to teach anything about Judaism without a text. So uh, get used to me always bringing some, some material. I will try to cut a lot less trees uh, for the future, but uh, this is what we have here. So uh, tonight I wanted to talk about God. Uh, let's start there, finish with God, and then move on. Uh, I mean, uh, Judaism, Judaism is a uh, text-centered religion. Uh, God is part of it. Uh, but uh, we also feel that the most important uh, part of teaching about Judaism is the encounter of the reader with the text. Um, and by the way, uh, just I don't know if you saw the New York Times edition of the book review, which happened last, uh, uh, last Sunday. Uh, there's a book now, uh, which is something that I said all those years, uh, when I was introduced in churches to speak about Judaism, I was always introduced as, this is Rabbi Azriel, and he is from the people of the book. And I will correct all of them and say, books, books, books. <laughs> so uh, 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 I think that, that his name is Kircher, and he wrote, uh, he put together uh, 12 different uh, texts, Jewish texts, that gives really a nice survey of uh, what happened in the last... Uh, uh, 2,000 years of uh, Jewish writing, because you can learn a lot about Judaism from the writing of uh, different periods. So here is the text. So uh, what I have here is some questions here in the beginning, but then of course the last three pages are pages with uh, Jewish text, uh, because uh, we, we Jews like to always uh, bring a proof text to what we say. Uh, so uh, thank God. Welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. They'll be right over. A what? They'll be right over. Mm -hmm. They are welcome to stay. Uh, so let's start with uh, introduction to what I wanted to do today, uh, which is uh, I love the noise in the background. Nice. Um, 
So, uh, again, the reading of the text is uh, essential. And so, uh, the text is the dialogue uh, between the people and uh, God. And uh, I, I want to start with the first text. Uh, if you look at the back of the text number one, after the first two pages of the introduction, uh, I always like to find volunteers that can also read the text. So this is the first time, text number one. Uh, do you see it? Uh, who would like to read? This is the first really encounter uh, of uh, God with a patriarch. Yeah, that's a tough competition. <laughs> it's a great smell, by the way. It's, uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, Noah is a biblical character, but it's really not, not a, an important guy because he was just righteous in his generation. So comparison to the rest of the population during Noah's time, everyone was corrupt. Noah was a little bit better. Uh, that's all. So Noah uh, doesn't really play an essential part in the Jewish relationship to God. So it starts with Abraham. So who would like to read the, from Genesis, the first chapter, the first uh, text? Anyone? Yes, please. Loud. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and I will bless those who bless you. And curse him that curses you. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. And Abram went forth as the Lord had commanded him, and Lot went with him. Lot was his relative, not a successful kind of guy. Uh, you know, we know what happened to his wife. Uh, if he was righteous, uh, this would not happen to the wife. Uh, but anyway, uh, so some of the blessings uh, that are here uh, is really the reason why we uh, came together for the tri-faith. You know, the blessing of Abraham. We look at Abraham as the patriarch that uh, we all share. So what is God uh, saying to him? The Hebrew words are fascinating. So you, go, you guys are going to hear some Hebrew here, okay? Is that okay? So the, the phrase is lech lecha, go forth, but it's the same root twice. Lech lecha, which means go, wake up, go into you, go into yourself in order to create this relationship with me. Uh, reading, uh, this is a sentence you're gonna hear me from time to time, reading uh, the Bible uh, with translation is like kissing a bride through a veil. <laughs> Who wants to do it? Uh, that's the difficulty of reading any kind of work in translation. So uh, from time to time you'll hear some Hebrew words that really will convey a better meaning to what's going on. So what is uh, God saying to Abraham? Uh, what is Abraham's first experience with God? What does he need to do in order to accept this new relationship? He needs to leave. Yeah. He needs to leave his surroundings. He needs to leave his uh, family. He needs to leave the occupation uh, of his family. He needs to move. You, you cannot understand me uh, if you don't start a journey. Uh, and we know how important it is, the journeys in biblical text. Uh, at the end of every journey, something happens. And uh, something starts in the beginning to force the move. Uh, and we still experience this in our lives. Uh, I think our best moments in our life is when uh, we start walking away, uh, finding something that maybe forces us to leave or uh, get us uh, awake from what some kind of a, uh, a comfort level, comfort zone, uh, to do something different. So, uh, he's asked to leave, go to a new country, and uh, he gets some great promises. The kids are drinking coffee too. Wow, this is really advanced church. <laughs> I'll have to bring it to the synagogue. To, uh, amazing. Hot oh, hot chocolate. Nice. Nice. I can't believe I suspected you. Uh, God is promising uh, to make the name of Abraham great. 
uh, and uh, to make uh, us numerous, to make us uh, all the families of the earth. So uh, that's the beginning of uh, not only establishing relationship with Abraham, but establishing relationship with the rest of humanity. So this is the entry of God into the relationship. Uh, so uh, why Abraham? Was, why was Abraham uh, selected? What was special about him? Uh, from the biblical reading, uh, we don't know anything about him. Uh, but here we have the Midrash. And so people that already took uh, my course on the Midrash understand uh, that there is, uh, this, this is part of the other books that we have. So you have the biblical level, the biblical text, the Old Testament, uh, the five books of Moses and the rest of the prophets. But in addition to this, there is extra material that uh, hopefully uh, my introduction to Midrash helped uh, explain what it is. Uh, so there is, a, there is a story about Abraham and why Abraham was selected. So who would like to read uh, text number two? Please. <coughs> yes. When Abraham was three years old, he went out of the cave and, observing the world, wondered in his heart, who created heaven and earth and me? At age three. This is a brilliant kid. When was the last time you had a kid three years old asking those questions? Wow. Okay. Go on. All the day he prayed to the sun. In the evening, the sun set in the west and the moon rose in the east. Upon seeing the moon and the stars around it, he said, This one must have created heaven and earth and me. These stars must be the moon's princes and courtiers. So all night long he stood in prayer to the moon. In the morning the moon sank in the west and the sun rose in the east. Then he said, There is no might in either of these. There must be a higher Lord over them. To him will I pray. And before him will I prostrate myself. I mean no wonder God spoke to him. I mean, age three, to come up with those amazing questions. There was something special in this kid. Uh, maybe he also knew how to play chess. I don't know. Uh, so uh, what's going on? He's just an observant of what? What is he looking at? Nature. Nature is a great teacher for us uh, to discover God, to discover the relationship to something higher and more important than us. And so he looks at the moon, he thinks the moon is God, and then the moon disappears, the sun comes, and the sun also disappears. So there must be some kind of a prime mover that is responsible to all this. By the way, uh, I found it interesting, this text that says that he came out of the cave. We need to come out of caves. Uh, where is, where you heard about the cave with, with someone else? Who? Well, Elijah is one. I was more uh, asking about Greek philosophy. So uh, there's a lot of caves in Greek philosophy. Everyone is coming out of the caves, and that's how they develop their philosophy. So the cave is a symbol for a womb, a symbol of uh, really not knowing and being able to come out from the darkness to the light. So that's a piece that uh, maybe was adopted from uh, other uh, writings, uh, which is okay. So. Um, so now we understand why he was selected, but uh, why does he have to leave his home? What was going on at his home that he needs to leave home? Uh, so the next story, text number three, is again another midrash on the story of uh, Genesis. Who would like to read the story in text number three? Anyone? Oh. Yes, please, yeah. Uh, don't be so shy, come on. Yeah. <laughs> A woman came carrying a bowl of fine flour and said, Here, offer it to the gods. So he had a shop. What kind of shop his father was running? An uh, idle, idle shop. Uh, don't you see sometimes in uh, gas stations where they sell? I always stop in front of those gas stations that they sell all those gods uh, to people. Uh, it reminded me of Abraham's home. Uh, when I look there. Uh, so, continue. At that, Abraham seized a stick, smashed all the images, and placed the stick in the hand of the biggest of them. So his father gave the shop to Abraham to run. The father went for some kind of a siesta. He comes back. What is Abraham doing? He, after he destroys all the idols, he puts a stick or a hammer 
uh, in the hands of the largest god. And his father now walks into the shop. That's a good story, guys. <laughs> Go on. When his father came, he asked, who did this to the gods? Abraham answered, would I hide anything from my father? A woman came with a bowl of fine flour and said, here, offer it up to them. When I offered it, one god said, I'll eat it first. And another said, no, I will eat it first. Then the biggest of them rose up and smashed all the others. His father replied, are you making sport of me? They can't do anything. Abraham answered, you say they cannot. Let your ears hear what your mouth is saying. Oh, what a chutzpah, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine a child speaking to his father this way? But, I mean, that's why he needed to move from that place. Haran, where the family... The family was uh, in the idle business. Of course, I mean, if you want to get to monotheism, you have to start with polytheism. Okay, so you have different gods, people pray to different gods. People still pray to different gods. Except, you know, they have different names now. Possessions, money, politics, alcohol. Yeah, I mean, so we just, uh, we, we still are worshipping gods. Uh, they're different. So, uh, so this is the first level of the relationship of how God enters into relationship with Abraham. And of course, he continues the relationship with Isaac and continues the relationship with Ishmael uh, through Hagar and, and the sending of Ishmael and Hagar to the desert. I mean, God blesses Ishmael and there, therefore uh, it's only a, definitely a natural place to invite the Muslim community into, because they're also the children of uh, Abraham. And so according to tradition, Jewish tradition, when Sarah died, and we don't know why she died, but she died after Abraham took the son to the mountain. Uh, so she woke up in the morning and didn't see the son and killed herself. Maybe that's one option. That's a midrash. So we have, we have text that explains things that are not clear in the Torah. So midrash is this extra material that was once upon a time transmitted orally from father to son, from mother to daughter, until uh, the Bible was canonized. And those other materials are still there, available for us. There are books that include all those stories of Midrashic material that is explaining things that are not clear in the Bible. I mean, how else you'll explain that he comes with his son back home and she died in the next chapter? What happened there? So you come up with a story that can be as accurate as all the rest of the stories. Did I tell you that uh, the Torah is a human product? Uh, yeah, yeah you, you, uh, you're invited not to leave. Uh, so, uh, I mean, written with great wisdom. I think the people who were involved in writing and uh, a good book to uh, get soft cover by a, na by a person named Friedman is who wrote the Bible. It's time for everyone in this congregation to read that book. Who wrote the Bible? Because it's uh, really the real detective story of what was going on. Um, anyway, look at text number four. Text number four appears also in the book of Exodus, appears actually twice in the Torah, in the five books. And this is the watchword of our faith. Uh, when you come to a Jewish synagogue, all synagogues are Jewish. Um, yeah, why did I say that? <laughs> Uh, you will hear as part of the uh, central part of the worship the following uh, phrase Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed You can see the translation of text 4 this is, this is really the password This is the Jewish password This is a password that also helps us pass from this world to the next world. So uh, the confessional, Jewish confessional. Yeah, Christianity did not invite, invent confessionals. <laughs> when I tell this to the Jews, they don't believe me. <laughs> this is, it, it's fascinating. Uh, this is what you say before you die. Uh, actually, you say it before you go to sleep at night. And you say it also when you wake up in the morning. This is the password that puts you 
what, what is this password saying? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, this appears, Israel is who is Israel in the biblical text? One of the patriarchs. What was the name of the patriarch before it became Israel? Jacob. Beautiful. So Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He becomes the, becomes, uh, the father of the uh, 12 tribes, uh, 12 boys, and also the girl that no one cares about, Dina. Uh, by the way, uh, The Red Hand, hopefully you read the book, The Red Hand, great book to read, by Anita Diamant. It's about, uh, about Dina and how come she was left out of feminine theology. Um, and I think she got uh, wonderful respect. So this is, the Shema is the hero Israel, but then it comes with uh, what are the responsibilities. So already in the beginning of the book of Exodus uh, is the following, uh, and let's, you know what, let's read it together. Uh, hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. By the way, those words are words that Jesus says. Yeah, yeah so uh, take to heart these instructions with which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Yeah, it's all about the kids, guys. It's all about you. All about you. That's why you're here in the room. <laughs> Just try to be modest now. Uh, uh, Speak of them when you're away, when you lie down, when you get up. Bind them as a sign upon your hand. This is part of the Jewish, I'm sure you saw uh, the tradition of putting a tefillin. Tefillin is those things we put over our heads, hands, and also we have a tefillin of head. And this is, the, this is a reference to the bind them uh, upon your hand and uh, they can ser serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inside the boxes of the tefillin are the, is the Shema, is this paragraph. And inscribe on the doorpost of your house, which is the mezuzah. That's why Jews have mezuzah. Those are the, a little bit tilted uh, to the house, pointed to the house. Why is it tilted? Anyone knows why the mezuzah is not straight, but it's tilted? Rabbis can agree. Excellent. <laughs> we have a Jewish scholar here. The rabbis were arguing that always. And some people suggested this, and some people this, so they compromise <laughs> on an angle, pointing, pointing to the house. Pointing to the house, which, you know, when you see a mezuzah, you know it's a Jewish home. That's why I don't understand why people knock on my door at 4 o'clock on Friday, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, and try to convert me. Uh, sometimes Mormons do it, and I always invite them to my house. Uh, just for the sake of it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they apologize, and I send it to the neighbors. Uh, so this is, this is this paragraph that connects to the Shema. Uh, and why? Look at the last line. This line appears so many times in the Bible. Uh, I, the Lord, am your God who led you out of Egypt. Uh, to be your God, I, the Lord, am your God. Uh, this connection between God and Egypt appears 32 times in the Bible. 32 in gematria. You know what gematria is? What's gematria? Gematria is putting a numerical value to every alphabet letter. So for example, Aleph, the first letter is one. Bet, the second letter is two. And it goes all the way to 400. So after, after the letter number 10, it comes to 20, 30, 40. It's, it's, it's part of Kabbalah. And we're not going to go there now. Okay. Because you need to be 40 years old, wealthy, and married to study Kabbalah. And there is such uh, amazing fascination with Kabbalah in America now. Uh, Madonna yeah. is uh, into Kabbalah. She doesn't know anything about Judaism, but she is into Kabbalah. Uh, anyway, it's interesting. Uh, I will be definitely uh, happy to teach this in the future. Uh, but. I want to make sure that you know that Kabbalah is only a branch of Judaism. Uh, Jewish mysticism exists, but one needs to understand the root and the trunk of Judaism in order to get to the branches. You can't start with the branches. You have to go from the roots. Um, that's a warning for all of us. Okay, uh, 
Then comes a text in Genesis, text number five. This is a major text. Uh, this is about Jacob. Uh, what am I? Why is this text important? That's Jacob's dream. Anyone can share with me the dream that Jacob had? No. Anyone? Well, it's a, it's a stairway to heaven. Uh, should I play the music in the background? Uh, who would like to read text number five? Please. Jacob left Beersheba. Beersheba and set out for Haran. He came upon a certain place and stopped there for the night, for the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a very hard head, and so he needed some stones. Go on. He had a dream. A stairway was set on the ground, and, it top, and its top reached to the sky. And angels of God were going up and down on it. And the Lord was standing beside him, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The ground on which you are lying, I will assign to you and to your offspring. Your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. Remember, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, so what, continue with the next page, because it continues on the top. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is present in this place, and I did not know it. Shaken, he said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the abode of God, and that is the gateway to heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He named that site Bethel, but previously the name of the city had been Luz. I always love this last uh, insight of the reductor of the Bible. Uh, but once upon a time, the name of that place was a different name, just in case you, you are ready to make a mistake. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this place, uh, which by the way has another name of God, place in Hebrew is Makom. Makom is a name, one of the 99 names that God has in Jewish tradition. Uh, maybe there's a hundred, but uh, people got tired after counting 99. Uh, so uh, every patriarch has his own experience with God. That's why when we pray uh, in our service, we pray God of our God and God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. So the question is, why do we need to mention all those gods? Because every one of the patriarchs and the matriarchs have different experience with God. It is possible it's the same God, but they had different experiences. And uh, by the way, uh, this blessing to Jacob is definitely not a blessing for the Jews alone. Because the blessing here says, I will make you as numerous as the, as what? As the dust and the stars. You know, how many Jews are in the world? 15 million. Come on. God lied to us? No, God's blessing to Jacob was about all of us. About all of humanity. We need to look at those patriarchs as paradigms for all of us. Uh, you would not uh, tell God that he's a liar. God forbid. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah. So, uh, here comes another experience. Jacob, and you see why Jacob is the one that the name changes to Israel. Uh, text number six. Look at what he does here. Anyone, please? Yes. That same night he arose, and taking his two wives, his two maid servants, and his 11 children, he crossed the port of the Jabbok. Jabbok, yeah, oh, Jabbok. Uh, this is again Jacob. What is he worry about? What is going to happen the next day? Who is coming toward him the next day? His brother Esau. You remember the relationship with Esau? Uh, Esau selling the birthright for a soup of lentil. I mean, I'll do a lot to get a good soup of lentil, but selling birthright? <laughs> but he runs away. He doesn't, he don't, they don't see each other for 20 years. So he hears that Esau is coming, so he does the right thing, which is what? He's afraid that Esau is going to kill him about the sale of the uh, birthright. Uh, and uh, he divides the camp. 
And continue, please. After taking them across the stream, he sent across all his possessions. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket, so that the socket <coughs> of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for dawn is breaking. But he answered, Jacob answered, Yeah. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, What is your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with the beings divine and human, and have prevailed. That's exactly what the name Israel means. Israel is this one who struggles to survive. It's, it's interesting how fitting that name is uh, for, for, for Jewish people and also for the state of Israel in a way. Uh, continue. Jacob asked, pray tell me your name. But he said, you must not ask my name. And he took leave of him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, meaning I have seen a divine being face to face, yet my life has, has been preserved. The sun rose upon him <coughs> as he passed Peniel, limping on his hip. Okay, so uh, uh, if you read the next line, has no connection to the same story, but this is an addition of the reductor that is teaching us about kosher meat eating. It has nothing to do with this, but read now the line that was added. After this? Yeah. That is why the children of Israel to this day do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the socket of the hip. Since Jacob's hip socket was wrenched at the yeah, it's, it's such a such an imaginative <laughs> sentence here, uh, trying to teach a whole different story to a later generation. So he used this incident of Jacob and the break uh, to uh, warn us about eating this kind of meat. Anyway, uh, the hand of the reductor and the hand of the people who worked on this is definitely felt throughout reading of the of the Old Testament. It's fascinating. You can find the. It's like a detective story. <coughs> All right, so what do we know about Jacob? He has a new name. Uh, actually, what happened the next day when they meet each other? What happens when Jacob meets Esau the next day? They make up. The what? They, he doesn't kill them, they make up. Yeah, they kiss each other. Yeah. Judaism and the text had difficulty with this happy reunion. They couldn't believe that there will be a kiss. So what, it's interesting, anytime you see the kiss in the Bible, it has special dots over the word kissing in every Torah scroll that is written. And those dots represent the teeth of Esau. It wasn't a kiss, it was a bite. Because they couldn't understand how Esau can turn to be a good person. Uh, yeah, if, if I had a choice, and we are working on uh, Tri-Faith, I will find some kind of a razor to clean those dots and forget about that teaching. Because when Torah scroll were written, uh, they were enemies, so the Esau represents the enemy, the other, the stranger. So they put dots just to <coughs> warn us. Never accept that there was a kissing, because the word is kissing. So they put those seven dots to represent the teeth of Esau. Uh, how many of you would like, if you had a choice, uh, to change also Old Testament, New Testament, write a new Torah? Don't you have a feeling sometimes that it's about time? We need to do something like this. Uh, and I think uh, I, there are parts of the, uh, of the Quran uh, that Muslims, when you, have, when you get them on a on a cup of coffee away from everyone else also have the same kind of feelings that maybe we can do some changes to improve relationship. Uh, we should not apologize for the text, uh, but we should definitely explain the text in the light of our lives now. And that's what Midrash is. Midrash is taking ancient text and trying to read into it things that are fitting our lives. 
I'm just suggesting this. Uh, okay. And now, of course, comes the book of Exodus. That's another encounter with God. So Jacob, we don't know what the man is. Who is the man? Maybe there was the uh, conscience of Jacob fighting inside of him. Uh, it's not clear. It says a man. It says in Hebrew, ish, ish. It can be translated into a man. But maybe this was something else going on. Some kind of a vision, some kind of a dream. Look at the book of Exodus, reading number 7. Who would like to read? I'm still very aware of the uh, clock and the watch. Yes, please. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. Moreover, I have seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, and you shall free my people, the Israelites, from Egypt. So the book of Exodus is moving away from singular appearances of God to patriarchs and matriarchs, and moving into what? According to a tradition, 600,000 people besides the riffraff left Egypt. So God appears to a larger number of people uh, because God needs to be known to more than just single patriarchs. Okay, so go on. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And you shall free the Israelites from Egypt? He said, I will be with you. That shall be your sign that it is I who sent you. And when you have freed the people from Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Moses said to God, He's very practical, Moses. Look at the question. Go on. When I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Okay, you're sending me for this mission? They don't know who I am. They don't know who you are. What should be the name that I should call you? when I appear in front of the Israelites or the slaves. Go on. And God said to Moses, Oh, I wanted to do a better job in Hebrew. Come on. asher <laughs> My name is, I will be what I will be. That is the translation of this phrase. What a brilliant introduction of God to Moses. In a way you can say, I will be what you will make me to be. I will be what you will understand I am. I, I am what I am, in a way. Uh, but it's, it's, it's us. We are the best public relations that God has. Without us, God is nothing. So that's, that's what is important now, to, uh, to say this name of God. And it's written here in Hebrew transliteration because it's an important sentence. C continue. He continued. Thus shall you say to the Israelites, eh -eh -eh, send, me eh -eh -eh, to you. send me to you. And God said further to Moses, I shall, Thus shall you speak to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This shall be my name forever. This my appellation to all eternity. That's the name that is given in the book of Exodus to God. I think it's a fantastic name. It allows us to establish our personal spiritual relationship with God. And every one of us has a different kind of relationship. And God understood this. All the writers of the Bible understood it. And it's beautiful. I will be what I will be. I am nothing without you calling me the name. God knows what God is. We are the one with the challenge. That's why uh, in Jewish tradition, the only way to talk about God, and that's why we don't talk about God a lot in Judaism. We, uh, I'm, I'm discovering how different we are about that. What we have is a way of expressing our relationship to God through the commandments and through rituals that we are responsible for. So. The definition of how to talk about God in Judaism is always to talk in negative attributes. You should never say what God is. Once you say what God is, you're putting God in a box. So we should do only with negative attributes, what God is not. That's my Maimonides teaching. 12th century, my Maimonides. What God is not. Well, it's a nice experience. Try for a week to talk about God as what God is not. Try. 
It'll be interesting. Because actually, God doesn't need definition. God knows who God is. We're the one with the problem, with the challenge. Okay, so this is in Exodus. So go to uh, the next text, again from Exodus. Who would like to read this? Please, thank you. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, yeah. the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire out of a bush. He gazed, and there was a bush of flame, yet the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why isn't the bush grown up? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he answered, here I am. And he said, do not come closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for this place on which you stand is holy ground. I am, he said, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord continued, I have marked well the plight of my people in Egypt, and have heeded their outcry because of their taskmasters. Yes, I am mindful of their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and bring them out of that land to a good, spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Yeah, uh, milk and honey and uh, a lot of enemies. <laughs> uh, that was the only way they will go, uh, this uh, false promise of God. I'm going to bring you to a nice oasis. Yeah, sure. Thank you, God. Okay. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, I mean, uh, the difficulty was Moses uh, had difficulty uh, in speech. God asked him where he wants to go to take the people. He wanted to say Canada. But by the time, by the time he said Canaan, I mean, that's what had ended up. We ended up in Canaan instead of Canada. Okay, so, uh, by the way, the burning bush, that's the appearance of God in Judaism. That bush was burning for generations before Moses got there. No one paid attention to the bush. What did Moses do? Just turn the face toward the bush and was hooked. By the way, Moses, Moses, when God calls him Moses, Moses, our tradition suggests that Moses, Moses was in the same sound that his father, the father of Moses, spoke to him. So God appeared to Moses at the bush in the image of his father because Moses, when he heard his name coming from supposedly the voice of his father, he immediately paid attention to this. Uh, this is our lives, guys. The burning bush is a symbol for what we do with our lives. Uh, how many times we actually stopped and looked at a bush? Those bushes are all around us. What do we do with this? And by the way, uh, there's a warning. Don't get too close. You, you need to have some space. You need to realize what kind of a scene you are seeing. So this is Moses discovery of God, and now comes the last text, text number nine. Please, there are two pieces to the text. If someone can read both nine and ten, ready? Anyone? Yes, please. A pagan once asked Rabbi Joshua Ben... Karha. Karha. Yeah, H, hey, the letter H is H. There's no other way to say ch. It's easy for you to say. I know, I know, I know. That's how you identify who is Jewish. If you don't say the ch correctly, <laughs> you're out. Anyway, go on. Why of all things did God choose the humble thorn bush as the place from which to speak with Moses? Yeah, why not the Trump Tower? Yeah. Why did Moses heard God's name from the Trump Tower? I mean, that's a more impressive way. Why a bush, a lowly bush? What's the answer? The rabbi replied, if he had chosen a carob tree or a mulberry tree, you would have asked me the same question. Yeah, so uh, that's a way for rabbis to talk to people. It's a terrible <laughs> way of talking. Go on. Yet it is impossible to let you go away empty-handed. That is why I am telling you that God chose the humble thorn bush to teach you 
that there is no place on earth bereft of the divine presence, not even a thorn bush. And the next piece from the Talmud, uh, Bar Kapara. Bar Kapara explained what is the brief text upon which all the major parts of the Torah depend. It is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Okay, that's basically all of the theology about God in Judaism. That's where it starts, and that's what it is. Every part of the text is conveying, uh, conveying this dimension of God, starting with Abraham at age 3, and moving all the way to the Talmud and the uh, Mishnah, and uh, everything else. So the, the relationship with God, the spirituality that Judaism has about God uh, is very simple. It's here. It's all here. Okay, so I'm opening for questions before the choir sings. <laughs> we have six minutes. Is everyone in the choir or there will be some people left? Okay, so I'm, I'm here to stay anytime. Yeah, please. I kind of ask the sound of pantheism. Continue. Well, I mean that everything that you look at has the presence of God. I mean, from the top of the mountain to the notion that God is everywhere, even in a lowly bush. Uh, I mean, it was important to take God from top of mountains, which was the imagination of the early people, to put him where? To put him in a tent of meeting, uh, inside of a uh, tent, inside of a covenant in the shape of the Ten Commandments, uh, look, at, look at the journey of God. Is it the same God with some people from 2,000 years ago if they are resurrected? I always wonder what will happen if Jesus or Moses or uh, Muhammad come back. They'll be freaking out. <laughs> they will need infusion and a, a long-term hospital visit <laughs> to discover what we did with where we started. So maybe they shouldn't come again. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know we're all waiting for a second coming. That's why, uh, by the way, evangelical Christianity loves Jews. Uh, they love us uh, theologically because we are the only one who can identify Jesus when he comes back. <laughs> uh, which is fascinating theologically that's why Muslims, they don't like Muslims because the Muslims cannot identify Jesus only the Jews okay so but one, one big difference I'm, I'm getting because I did a couple of the Midrash and, and this is the, in growing up Christian there's a much more of a fascination with the afterlife than there is with the here and now. Although I think that's been changing now. God, I hope so. But yeah, yeah. Because it was uh, Jews, more Jews, focus on something else. Yeah, uh, Jews here. never had uh, time enough or leisure time to contemplate their navels. <laughs> so we we have been all our uh, history is basically uh, trying to survive the moment. So a lot of the emphasis in Judaism, uh, I will say, until we start building golf courses. That's why, that's why it was important to create a tri faith and destroy the golf course. Uh, I think coming to America, for the Jew, coming to America uh, was the beginning of nirvana, in a way, of uh, having time to contemplate uh, life after. But most of our history is about here and now. Uh, and we have all the ingredients of how to live a meaningful spiritual life here and now. Uh, it's so interesting. Uh, I, I mean, the, the books that I have about afterlife that are written by Jews, they can only fill maybe one shelf. Most of the books is about all the rest of the writings and all the rest of the commandments and the interpretation of the commandments. Uh, because this is a way of, I mean, the, the stairway of Jacob is exactly what mystical Judaism talk about, the, the climbing up. All the world in mystical Judaism, Hasidic Judaism, is vertical, never horizontal. It's about climbing, rung after rung after rung, and it's like, uh, uh, what was the game we played when we were kids? Shoots and letters? That's it. 
and you get to the end almost and then you fall all the way down. That's life. That's the Hasidic mystical understanding of the world. Uh, you don't see it, but it's, there are pipes here that connect the earth. That's why the stairway to heaven is so powerful. Because you need to have the grounding in order to be able also to taste the heaven. It has to be this kind of a connection between the two worlds. Um, yeah, so there are more books now about life after death. And uh, this is a question that I'm asked by the Jews all the time. You know, that's why I left them. <laughs> uh, I, I think death is something we know. We're not here. Life is something we don't know anything about. And so most of the Jewish text is there to sustain and support uh, life here, here and now. Uh, I, I get those questions when I go to a nursing home. Most of the time when I get to a nursing home and visit my people, uh, and that's the question they ask me. Because, uh, and so I lie to them. Uh, I say to them, yeah, you're going to see your mother. <laughs> Why not? Why not to, make a, to bring a smile? Right. Do I know if this is what will happen? Uh, are they going to come after me if it doesn't happen? <laughs> so, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what's wrong in lying and giving some hope to someone? I think that's the role of the clergy. Maybe not in this church. But <laughs> that's what Jews have done for a long time. Uh, any other questions? So my plan is the next two, or just to give you a preview of the next two sessions. So the next two sessions will be about Jewish ethics, because it's not about God. It's about the way we behave with each other. That's why you have Ten Commandments, and the first four are relationship between us and God, and the next one, the next five on the left side, whatever. I always have Charlton Heston in my mind, <laughs> carrying those, yeah. The, um, I, I love him so much that when he came to town, when he was alive, the head of the NRA, I collected some clergy and we demonstrated a court across the way from the hotel when he was here. And how, was, how can Moses be the head of the NRA? <laughs> uh, he didn't like us. Uh, anyway, um, may his memory be a blessing. I love when they show it before Passover to all the, you know, they, they do Jesus and, and the Ten Commandments, the movies, before Easter Passover. Here are some crumbs for the religious people that are watching TV. Uh, they, uh, so I will do ethics, and they will do also uh, community. So those three things, God, ethics, community, are the essential parts of what Judaism is all about. Once you understand how this works, uh, those three components, you understand Judaism. We're not so complicated. Really, we're not so complicated. Community. Questions, yes? I was curious about the Shema. To, what is technically the Shema? Is it to say the Shema, do you say, I technically said it, to fulfill that, that commandment that a Jew has to follow? Is it just the first line, the Shema? You no, the, or the, is it the, the two lines. Too? The, the, the second line. Not the whole, uh, thou shall love your God. No, just the Shema, Israel, hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And the response. What is the response, the second line? It's there. Look, Baruch Shem Kevod Machuto Le'olam By the way, where is this language taken from? It's taken from the last few moments of Jacob laying in a bed, ready to die, and who is around the bed? All his sons. So he, they say to him before he dies, Hear, O Israel, hear our Father. The Lord is one, the Lord is our God. And Jacob responds to them, Baruch Shem Kevod Machuto. Thank God you said it. So this is the legacy that Jacob leaves on deathbed to his children. It's taken from the book of Genesis. Okay. Those are the two lines that appear in the book of Genesis before he dies. So, so when a Jewish person wakes up and goes to bed, that's what they say? That's why... It's okay. Uh, that's what uh, the, the, they say. Uh, that, so you say it, uh, to enter into this world, that's also in the prayer of the bris the circumcision and the welcoming of a girl to uh, the religion and to life, and then you say it before you die. 
So I ended up uh, sometimes in hospital rooms when uh, the, the person who is uh, dying uh, and with the family around where we, I asked the people to say together because maybe uh, the man was incapacitated or the woman to say that because they're not conscious. So the family recites the, the line. Uh, by the way, uh, I had also a man that I did it three times and nothing happened. He's still alive and he's, he's, he's in an assisted living now having a wonderful life. <laughs> and uh, every time he sees me when I visit, oh my God, don't, don't say it again. Don't say it. You, you earlier described it though as, as a confession. It, it's part of the vidui, the confession that the, the Jew does uh, when, before they die. So we have a language of confession, too, and that's what's required for the person to say. If he is not capable of saying it, uh, I mean, you should try to do it before, I mean, if you know that it's terminal, but then the family participates in saying it. Rabbi, are these the words that are written around the sanctuary at the temple? No. Oh, okay. There, there is, it's on a wall, the Shema is in the wall. Okay. Shema Israel Adonai Lohan, not on the window. But not around the windows. Not the windows. Okay. The windows are asking God uh, to uh, spread over us a shelter of peace. So two of the windows, the people inside can read, yes. and the two other windows, the people that are building their houses of worship can read. Yeah. We did it with them outside, welcoming people. Uh, is this okay, the answer? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I just think that in a, you know, when I think of the confessional, or confessing, you know, that it's... Um, so you guys die without confessing? <laughs> no, but I think... All of you are righteous? You got <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it's, it's to ask, you know, for confessing or acknowledging sins or the wrongs that we've done with the hope or thought that in, in confessing and verbalizing those or praying about those that we would be forgiven and this to me is it you know is it is a, is a very beautiful acknowledge, acknowledgement i don't think but it, i guess but maybe that's my own definition well, no no it, it's definitely this uh, you guys took the confessional from us <laughs> i mean we were first and then you guys came so uh yeah that's it admitting that god is one at the end of one's life that i acknowledge god that's the powerful piece uh but, but in Christianity, there's also a language for the confession. I mean, so, so Judaism suggests that you need to ask forgiveness one day before you die. And of course, the question comes up, how do you know when you're going to die? Oh, that's why you have to confess every day, because you never know. Any other questions? You can ask on a different topic. I mean, whatever, I'm here. Everything you always wanted to ask a rabbi. <laughs> yes? When it talks about the divine or God communicating to people, patriarchs or every day, what's happening? Is there a divine being speaking to human beings or...? You see, that's the... When you say the word speaking, you are speaking in human language that is not divine. He doesn't talk in English? <laughs> <laughs> Only, only in Mel Gibson's movies. Yes. <laughs> that, that's why I love those movies, because I'm trying to see the stupidity of what he does with the language. I mean, they all speak fluent English. Come on, in those days, sometimes he tries to keep it authentic, which is nice. I love when he keeps it in Aramaic, but you have to find actors that can speak Aramaic. Oh, it is. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I don't know, how is God speaking to you? Talk um, to me about your communication with God. Why do you have to worry about other people? Th there's a, a tradition in Christianity of having a personal relationship with God and walking with God, and I don't quite understand that, and I've never made sense of a divine being in the sky talking to people, so it seems to be like an insight or something happening inside of us that says this is who we are meant to be or, or experience in life. Beautiful. And it's working for you. Sometimes. <laughs> He's still wondering. Yeah. Like all of us, why well, it should be different. Uh, 
but but I, I think this idea of always lifting my eyes to the to the heaven for God. Are you kidding? I look at the person sits next to me that prays. God is there. Why do I have to look at heaven all the time? It seems to be so far away. Actually, God is in the person who is next to you, because all of us are creating God's image. I never understood the the looking up. Stairway. What? Stairway. Yeah, but but I think there are people around us that are wonderful manifestation of the quality of and the attributes of God. We Jews, uh, we Jews know that uh, we we are, we are only can imitate God. And how do I know about God? From what's written in scriptures, what God does. That's the only way to do it. We, we don't have saints in Judaism, except our mothers. All Jewish mothers are saints. <laughs> there are so many evil jokes about that. It's terrible. Wonderful. Uh, I'll see you next week on uh, Wednesday. Yeah, please.